Get everybody to grab their seats. We have the last panel of the day. Uh, my name is Dan Gillen. I'm proud to be the, uh, a professor and chair of the Department of Statistics with an ICS. Um, I've been here long enough to see the school grow. Um, not quite the full 50 years here, but certainly I've got to see the trajectory go exponential since I've been here. So it's a, it's a real honor to be part of this celebration and to uh, attempt to moderate this panel, which is charged with the small task of preparing for the future. You know, it's just a very, very tiny task here. Uh, luckily, uh, we have a very esteemed panel of seven individuals, though, that have promised to instill wisdom upon all of you with, uh, I think Dan put it as two-minute nuggets of, of wisdom as we go through these questions here. Um, but before we begin, you know, the theme of today is really to think about preparing for the future, both in terms of our responsibilities from a training perspective, from a research perspective, but I think also to echo some of the comments that have been made today from a societal perspective and from an ethical perspective as well, given the ubiquity of computing in society and our roles in it. Um, so before we get going, though, I think that it would be good to uh, maybe have each of the panel members introduce themselves and maybe talk a little bit about yourselves and your connection to UCI before we get rolling. So would you like to start, Dan? Sure. Undergraduate, 73 to 77, which is a long time ago, many revolutions ago. I then went off to Rochester to get my PhD in artificial intelligence, um, went to Xerox Park, and then I got better. I recovered from the AI problem. Uh, and I, uh, I've been doing human-computer interaction ever since. I'm now at Google, where my AI background and my HCI background are now colliding and interlocking like this. So I've been, it's been and I've been coming back here ever since for, for off and on. I'm Tim, I graduated in 1986 with the undergraduate and then stayed on to get my MBA so I didn't have to go work because of those days all my friends were going to EDS and Arthur Anderson and some of the other uh, technology companies. But uh, I started a company during the time and said if it fails I'll go get a job and luckily I didn't have to get a job and uh, built systems and it was an exciting time because this was the days when we were pulling data from mainframes, which I didn't even study data when I was here. I focused on my love of the arts and studied the, well, the part of the human computer interface, but it was also looking at computer graphics, which was very rudimentary at the time, and this thing called virtual reality, which didn't quite exist, but I wanted to learn about it, so I, I studied it. And uh, went off, did that for many years, but I have always been in the arts too, and now it's predominantly on Broadway. We produce and I direct on Broadway, and my wife's still a Broadway performer. And we do musical films, which is tied directly to my computer science education, which you'll learn about later. <laughs> Excellent. And now for something completely different. <laughs> I got my PhD here in 97, uh, and I'm a professor at the University of Washington. I'm Pedro Dominguez, so you already know that. <laughs> I'm Michelle, can you all hear me? I'm Michelle, um, I am a fourth year PhD student in the Department of Statistics. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm uh, Jonathan Chen. Um, so back in 2001, I started a joint MD-PhD medical scientist training program at UC Irvine, and I got the PhD in, in, com in computer science. I signed up for a nine-year program, that means four years MD and five years in the CS PhD. I clearly did not know what I was signing up for, um, and most people didn't, but it seemed like a good combo. That might work out one day, and I think it really has, ultimately, but trying to figure out what that meant wasn't clear at the time. That training really helped me then get on to Stanford, where I did my internal medicine training, and now I'm an assistant professor at Stanford in biomedical informatics research. Lou Ann Boyd. I'm one of the recent grads. I just graduated with my PhD in June. And I came to know this department maybe 10 years before when Dr. Jillian Hayes had come into the community where I worked as an autism therapist for 20 something years. And she brought new technologies there. And that was one of the most exciting parts of my year was when she would come and bring tech and we would try it out. And so over the course of several projects I worked with her, I finally made the leap and just decided to leave that job and come and pursue a PhD in informatics. And now I'm an assistant professor at Chapman with a lab that's building more assistive technology for autism. Uh, hi, I'm Samir Singh. I'm an assistant professor in ICS right now. I'm in my third year. 
Uh, I do research in machine learning, especially interpretable machine learning. How do we work with these black boxes? And I also work in natural language processing. So how do you extract information from text? Great, so an amazing panel. Maybe we can just welcome them. So I think you can see that we have purposely kind of filled the stage with not only experts in their respective fields, but also with a wide variety of individuals that kind of span the time frame past ICS to think about where we're going to go into the future and where our needs need to be allocated as we move forward. And so um, you can't take the statistician out of the boy, right? So <laughs> I think one way of preparing for the future is to try and condition a little bit on the most immediate past as we kind of go through. And so do that forecasting with some empirical data. So I think if, if I can ask for some of you, can you comment on maybe the foresight and training that you had received while you were here at UCI and how that's impacted your successful trajectories? I mean, a lot of you are completely esteemed. Most of you actually have, have kind of come through. Michelle is getting ready to trailblaze in the area. So how does, how does the training at UCI, how has it prepared you and, and, and what was the foresight in that training? Well, I learned how to copy code. <laughs> okay. and, and you laugh, but um, I, I was actually working on DCS, which we talked about in the previous thing with uh, Dave Farber's project, and it was, I think, in Algol. Does anybody remember the language? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, um, it, was, it was deeply weird and complicated, and networking computers was strange at the time, and I remember trying to build something. I forgot it was, some, like, DNS service or something, and I could not figure out for the life of me how to do it. Uh, and so finally, some graduate student took pity on me and said, oh, just look at my code. And so I looked at the code, and I learned a lot by doing that. And I, I say that sort of semi-seriously, because without Stack Exchange, we would not be here. <laughs> and you know it's true. Um, and so uh, learning BNF uh, is a terrible way to learn a language. Right? And that's the way we were taught. So there are a lot of things that I learned at ICS in the 70s, which were, were forgotten, or properly so, I think. And so now, though, the, the, the thing that sticks with me is sort of the willingness to ask other people, the sort of, you know, sort of metacognitive skills, being willing to take a piece of code and learn from it, working with others, all that kind of stuff. Because truthfully, production rules that I learned in the 70s kind of not a thing anymore, right? But the other meta skills really persisted. It's interesting to see how, when I came here in the 80s, it was going through a transition because we were moving from a lot of the classes being on the mainframe to the, quote, personal computer, which was a Terak at the time, which I'm sure three people can spell in the room in total. And the faculty was dealing with it in different ways. There were certain people that were supportive of that move, and there are others that thought this is going to destroy everything that created the foundation of who we are. And I remember one class in particular where it just flat out wasn't working, and we had an assignment due. And I went to the professor. I said, the machines aren't working. And he said, well, that's not my problem. <laughs> well, actually, it is. <laughs> but, uh, but, but it was that moment where it's like, well, screw you. I'm, I'm going to figure this out, and I'm going to fix it. So I took the computer apart in the lab. A lab technician comes screaming at me. And I said, well, it's not working, and i got to get my assignment due. And it was that kind of in the MacGyverness that was instilled in us that uh, is what I've taken more than anything because the technology changes every year and the languages change. In my day, it was Pascal that was going to change the world. And I learned it, but you, you learn how to learn the language. And then today, when you look at education, you can almost find everything online as far as the raw content. Therefore, what value does a university bring, which as a community is something that I found when I came here, and what I see now that I go back and mentor young students is that ability to, to mind share in a way that doesn't have anything to do with, per se, the data, but it's building this collective and how you form a career and a life out of it. And it's, it's exciting to see that, that that hasn't changed. The most important thing I learned at UCI, uh, I think, was the experimental methodology of machine learning. And the importance of that, I think, can't be overstated. You know, machine learning is 
you know, everywhere in the world today. You know, one industry after another, one application after another. And most of the attention is on the new advances in machine learning or the new applications. But deep down, the most important thing that has driven all of this is the experimental methodology that people developed in the early 90s. This notion of having a repository of data sets, which was, of course, the UCR repository, and of having, you know, doing cross-validation. All these things seem completely commonsensical today. Having training data and test data, having performance measures, having dependent and independent variables, doing lesion studies, doing learning curves. It's because of that that machine learning is today as successful as it is. If you look back to the 80s, you know, this was the era when, you know, computers, everybody could not play with computers, and there were a lot of different fields where people were playing with computers, and, mach and machine learning was just one of them. People were doing these little toy algorithms on these little toy problems. Fast forward that to today, and we're in a completely different world. And it really changed when people started saying, well, we have to compare these things, and we have to compare them using some methodology. And that, more than anywhere else, was developed here at UCI. Now, UC Atro doesn't get enough credit for that. It was people like Pat Langley and Dennis Kibler and Mike Pazzani, also people like you know, Ray Mooney at Austin and Jude Chavlik at uh, uh, Wisconsin. But more than anywhere else, that methodology was born here. And it's what I learned, right? I'd been doing research in my master's degree you know, before coming here. But, but by being here, I learned, you know, I was very lucky, right? I was in the right place at the right time for machine learning. The time was the mid-90s and the place was UCI. There were, you know, I wanted to get a PhD in machine learning. I came to UCI because this was one of the two or three places that actually had a machine learning group at all, right? Between faculty and students, there were maybe 30 people doing machine learning here in the mid-90s. This was completely on a different scale. Most of the top departments had zero machine learning going on. So I really learned all of that. Uh, you know, I, I, I used that in, in my PhD. I still look back on my PhD more you know, there were the algorithms that I developed, but what I most like about it was like the very sound methodology that I followed. And this was like something I totally learned, you know, from, from, from people like Dennis Kibler. And it's been with me ever since, and it's one of the most important things I teach my students. And I think this methodology applies even beyond machine learning. I think it's something that is useful in every area of life. In a way, it's the scientific method, but applied in the ways that we can apply today. So that, I think, was extraordinarily valuable. I mean, I think <clears throat> on that note, you know, I mean, I think one of the things, you know, just thinking about machine learning having such a long history here and concentration, I think one of the things that I've loved about UCI since coming here from my previous faculty position is that UCI is quick to anticipate the changes that are coming and be able to adapt to them. I, I, I've found that in my time. I mean, a classic example of this is the inclusion of statistics in the School of Information and Computer Science, which to many of us in the room may sound like a completely natural thing, but it is a rarity across the country, actually. We're one of the few schools of information and computer science that actually houses a statistics department. Um, and so I think that ability to adapt to, to grow into data science now and to cross collaborate across different schools and departments with inside of the institution has kind of been a, a, key, a key driving factor, I would say, in how we've been able to adapt and, and, and grow into the future. I mean, Jonathan, you did kind of a, you did your MD, PhD here, and so you really had first hand experience of kind of that cross collaboration and, and adaptation. Do you want to comment on it at all? Uh, sure, I, that's exactly what I was going to comment on, that that was a really kind of key value of coming to that program. And then there's a biomedical informatics training program that brought together people from different disciplines. And what I feel I learned a lot about was how to do that cross-collaboration and communication. I mean, every year at the medical scientist training program, they have a retreat where students present their work, and the first couple of years, look at this cool technology I built, this cool algorithm. And I feel like people, are like they just don't care about what I'm doing. They're all studying immunology or biology. They don't even understand what I'm saying in some sense. And learning how to make that translation you know, by the end of the year, by the end of my PhD, I was winning all the presentation awards from the medical group because I was able to communicate and learn how do you translate that into something that they can relate and understand to. And they, they taught me also about how to not build a cool hammer and ask for a nail smash. How do I recognize what's their problem that needs to be solved and translate that? And um, that's something I still continue to teach my own students to this day, how to think about communicating across disciplines and starting from a problem and then bringing the cool solution to it. I mean, and Michelle, you're, you know, you're being trained in the Department of Statistics, and I think one of the founding principles and one of the many reasons why, why many of the faculty that are in statistics came here is because our theoretical and methodologic work is, 
is heavily motivated by applications and sciences in different areas. So what's been your experience and how UCI has been able to kind of train you in terms of not only being an expert in one field, statistics, but being an expert in at least another field, which is where your motivating examples and applications are coming from? So one thing I wanted to say was just the emphasis that's placed, and it goes along with what you just said, on being able to interpret the results in a way that other people can understand, even if they're not in your field. And I think that's very important. I remember getting our first homework assignment, and they were like, interpret this in a way that someone that hasn't done statistics can understand. And I was like, how do you do that? Um, but it's something that you keep practicing, and that along with the collaborations. And I, I think that that's very important. And although I'm still here, I can see it being important once, once I finish. Um, in terms of uh, learning to, like, be becoming an expert in a different field, they've, that, I, all of the professors that I've met, they have collaborations in other fields, and we get the opportunity to be involved in those things, and I think that that's very important as well, because if we want to answer a statistical question, we want to know what's going on, and we want to know the science behind it as well, and, and, and that's, that's encouraged in the, de in the department, and I think that's been very helpful. I mean, and Luann, in, in, in informatics, I mean, that's heavily multidisciplinary across, even within the faculty, moving across different, different genres. I mean, what was your experience like coming through informatics, which, again, is, is really a spearhead department, I would say, across the country here? Absolutely. I would say um, I was, one, tickled that I could leverage my experience, my domain knowledge, and bring it to this department. Just having that opportunity to come with all this experience in one field and apply it to a new field was extraordinary. And then being able to work across uh, many, many different teams, I think some of the best things I got out of being here were all the opportunities between hearing speakers doing all kinds of different stuff, classes learning different methodologies, and then having opportunities to work on real world problems as well, uh, and having that be multidisciplinary approach to do that. So I got to see behind the scenes each role and uh, kind of play my role in that. Um, I think, and then I've taken that and put it right back into my classes where we make every, we run classes like their startup companies. We, we run projects right in the class. You might be learning content about software requirements, but we're running it as if we're making the requirements for our company. So kind of seeing it from all those angles has really set me off onto a good start. And Samira, I mean, so you, how do you, how do you bring that adaptability into, into your training, into the classroom, both at the undergraduate and graduate level? I mean, how, how, how does this work for you, and do you get the, the degrees of freedom, so, you, so to speak, at, at UCI to be able yeah, to? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, before I came to UCI, I was a postdoctoral researcher, so this was my first professor appointment. And it was pretty much a rude awakening the first time you walk into class and you see, like, hundreds of students from really diverse backgrounds. I mean, that's one of the benefits of the attention machine learning is getting, is it has attracted a really wide population of students. And so being able to do really interesting things, not just for the kind of people I'm familiar with, but sort of proposing new courses and designing sort of exercises that a lot of people would have fun with was, has been quite incredible. I mean, so, you know, our dean kind of earlier today, when he kicked off the session, he, he had made the statement, um, and I agree with it, that, you know, not too long ago, and of course time is relative for all of us as we, as we think about this, but, you know, computing was more of a, an academic or research curiosity to some degree. Today, computing is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. And, and whether it's tangible and right in front of someone's um, face or whether it's if it's determining whether they're going to be interviewed for a job or reading polls on who might be elected in the next campaign. Um, it's touching all of us as we move through time, um, both from a data science perspective, but just computing in general. So can I ask some of you all to comment on kind of what's changed in your time, how that's kind of changed your views of computing and your responsibilities as you think about your role in computing as you go through? Um, sure, so, so Pierre Baldi was my PhD advisor and he literally wrote the book, Machine Learning, Approach to Bioinformatics, and so obviously learned a lot from him. And so by the end of my PhD, I was actually really building an expert system for organic chemistry, and I think it was Dennis Kibble asked me, he's like, where's the machine learning? Why aren't you doing that? Pierre's your advisor. He's like, I feel like I've learned enough about machine learning to know that I don't trust machine learning. Uh, what was the irony at, at the time, right? This is a good, like, 10 years ago, um, and how things have evolved since, and I'm spending five more years getting my medical training, and I'm seeing Facebook and Google take off and Amazon recommendation systems. Wow, that's so cool. From a pure intellectual point of view, I think that would be really cool stuff to work on. 
oh, but I'm in medicine, I, you know, I, I can't do that, right? I gotta, I gotta do something else. Um, and it's been very rewarding in just the past few years that really there's been a convergence. The data is now available, now there's electronic medical records, there's all these clinical data sources, and wait a minute, you know, I'm a doctor, I'm trying to figure out what to do, I don't know what to do, I wish I could look at the last thousand doctors what they did, and it occurred to me, wait, that's not just an idea, that's what a recommender system is, and I actually have the training, I could prototype that, um, and that was a very unique thing that, to bring that together that just I don't think was possible before. Many people had thought of these ideas before, but it wasn't possible before. That also comes with a, a high level of, of responsibility to, to understand those methodologies and the appropriate application, and going back to Michelle's point, the interpretation, right? I mean, when we think about electronic medical records, well, why are individuals being measured or sampled, or why do they have particular records inside of a database, and who are you generalizing to? So I, I, would, I would presume that you know, that's where the core foundational training of, of going back and forth is really at your advantage as, as you think about these things. I would absolutely say, but yeah, I'll let people second. So today, everybody, everybody uses computers today, right? But even if it's just their cell phone, right? But I think people today use computers in a very impoverished way. We as computer scientists have actually have an amazing power that nobody else does, which is we know how to actually program the computers to do things. This is on a completely different level from having an app that you make a few selections on. And this gap is very unfortunate. And you know, if I had one wish for the next 10 years, it would be to see that gap disappear. Everybody should be able to tell computers what they want them to do at any level, in any form. And part of what's going to plug this gap is, is better AI. And what we're starting to see with machine learning and NLP and so on is that people can start to, but this is really just in the beginning, they can start to communicate with computers better than they can you know, just by using standard you know, software and, and so on. And I think this has a long way to go and we want to foster that as much as possible. Because imagine the amount of innovation that will happen if anybody can take their idea and say, oh, I want not just to do this thing with this existing you know, program, but you know, I want the computer to do this for me. And then, it, and, then, and then other people will start to use it and so on. So I think it's, so to make this happen, right, I think there are several things. We, AI and machine learning researchers, we have the responsibility to do research with this in mind. Like a lot of my research has been motivated by trying to make machine learning doable by people who do not have a PhD in machine learning. By people who just, you know, they're experts in the domain, they want to build their models, they can do that without getting under the hood. And of course, there's a trade-off between that and how powerful the machine learning is, but, but I think we're making good progress. This, on the research side. On the, on the education side, however, I think one of the most important things that has to happen, and it's already started to happen, it's so in the beginning, is that everybody, no matter what their major is, I mean, today everybody, no matter what their major is, knows how to use a text editor or a spreadsheet, et cetera, et cetera. I think everybody going forward is going to need to know how to use AI. You with AI doing your job as you know, a doctor or, or, you know, or a physicist or, 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 or a manager, if you, ha if you know how to use AI, you're on a different scale of power than if you don't. And often in the media you see this you know, false dichotomy of, oh, you know, will machines take all our jobs away and man versus machine? That is not, you know, machines aren't gonna replace humans anytime soon. The real question is people with AI and companies with AI, organizations with AI, countries with AI, competing with the ones who don't know how to use AI, there's gonna be no contest. And success in AI and machine learning always comes from a combination of understanding the AI, but also understanding the domain. Right, you know, machine learning without domain knowledge actually doesn't go anywhere. The data by itself doesn't, doesn't buy you anything. And the thing is, we right now, for us computer sciences and machine learning experts, this is a great time because, you know, like Tukey said, we get to play in everybody's backyard, right? You know, we, we get to collaborate with everybody on different things that they do. I think 10 years from now, those people will have internalized the machine learning that they need, and they'll be the ones driving those, those fields forward. And I think on the educational side, we have to, you know, uh, contribute to, to, to make that happen. Can I amp amplify your point? I think you're, you're right, but there's another part, which is the human side of this equation, right? So one of the things that happened to me personally is I got my PhD, and I was a dyed-in-the-wool AI guy, and so I built an expert system. Fabulous. Tried to have real humans use it, 
is a miserable failure. So I think we can design AI systems and ML systems and whatever, but we actually have to be human-centered in this. So I'm looking for a synthesis of all these different kinds of things that we're learning and teaching our students, the things we're building. So because it's great that we can build these systems, but without actually being aware of what the people know, expect, and think about, then we're building in isolation. So I think we actually have to extend the technology basis on which we're building and include the humans who actually use and live with this technology. Yeah, and I, you know, going back to, to something that Pedro had said, I mean, th there's an aspect of, of creating the tools that everyone can use, but then there's also an aspect of kind of training or at least safeguarding the use of those tools, right? I mean, and we, we've come through this multiple times at different phases in different scientific disciplines. And, you know, I mean, if you think about the use of AI, you know, I mean, someone mentioned earlier the, you know, Amazon kind of recalling their interview process because of built-in biases and how they're training those, those models. And so, that aspect also has to come with the training, right, of the next generation. And as we put these tools out there, it's kind of thinking about using them responsibly, so to speak. I mean, do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, I think I, there's, sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, go, do you have a, something quick? Yeah, there's, <laughs> you know, just, I, I thought you, he was asking that question, okay. but maybe I was wrong. Yeah. Well, let, me, let me say a couple of things and then, yeah. I think there's two aspects to this question. One is the AI engineers, if you will. I think our job, is not to embed our ethical views into our systems. That is very dangerous, and unfortunately, there's a lot of what happens today. Ethics is something that people disagree on and always will, and it's, and it's fine. What we have to do is make it very easy for different people, different organizations, different society to embed their principles into the AI systems. For example, in the form of the objective function. A lot of what's wrong with AI today is that the objective function is just engagement. And then you engage people with, you know, news and so on and so forth. We have to, you know, explain to people that, you know, here's the car, here's the steering wheel, here are the pedals. Where you drive it is up to you. Our job should, make, should be to make it easy for people to do that. Then on the part of everybody else, people need to understand that they have and they need to demand the power to shape the technology for their ends. And this unfortunately doesn't happen enough today. The power is too much in the hands of the large companies, et cetera, that already know how to use AI. We need to get to a point where like everybody, every citizen, every society can actually have an informed discussion about how we use AI. And I think that is starting to happen, but I think that has a long way to run as well. I think Tim is chomping at the bit right now. <laughs> on this. There's a lot that you've said that I agree with and some that I will take a counter position on, which is machine learning and AI is already replacing jobs. So the fact to say that it's not going to happen, it, it is happening. And I remember the first system that I built where I found that it was gonna replace some jobs, that was a, a real ethical dilemma that I was not prepared for in school because we're taught how to do and how to solve problems. And I had to decide if I wanted to continue, to continue with this. This was an insurance company that was gonna replace a lot of actuaries because they were able to create a, that time called decision support system, which we use a bunch of different monikers for it. And I met with the people, and none of them liked their jobs. <laughs> because it was really boring. I mean, they sat with these things looking for patterns. But at the same time, they were afraid that they couldn't do anything else. And it was a system, I ended up, I ended up building it, and I worked with a company to do a retraining, and that's how I actually got into training is to start to say, I'm gonna help you move this, and I did that in the Wall Street days, moving from mainframes to Java and .NET in those worlds. But at the TED conference this year, it came up in a lot of conversations about what are we doing in this industrial revolution where machines are changing? And I take a positive view on this, which is we're opening up new frontiers, and that's an exciting area that we can work cross-discipline with to look at when these jobs that have disappeared, what is the new economies and how are we going to create those? And that'll be a panel next year. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and Luann and Samir, I mean, so, you know, educating folks at UCI, I mean, how, how are you going to adapt to this? I mean, do ethics come into the way that you're teaching and how you're teaching and, 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 and what, 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 is the, what is the changing curriculum as we go forward? I think you guys have nailed it when you talk about user-centered approaches. And so I teach the HCI class. And so we, 
you have this class set up that everybody plays the role as a developer as well as a user. And so they're, they get to understand the 24 other students in the class that they're having to, they get to try their variations of prototypes. Uh, and then we also talk about the taking it out in the bigger world and, and how diversity is so important in understanding how your product works and your product is nothing if it doesn't work for a diverse set of people. So I think you guys are bringing up exactly the right points in terms of really understanding what users need and how people use things differently and um, you know, where, the, where they can go with that. And ultimately, can we design kind of toolkit interfaces where people could, could customize to make, their, make things work for them versus, and know how to make the machines do what they need them to do for them versus having AI take over for them? Uh, I think I agree with Pedro um, on this point of, you know, ethics is still a pretty fuzzy concept, especially to computer scientists. We are not trained in ethics. And so for machine learning to come in and say this is ethical and this is not is a little bit uh, stepping out. What is important, though, is, I mean, we like technical problems, to look at technical problems that allow people to understand what machine learning models are doing in a way that's most intuitive for them. So human-centered, again. Uh, but give them the transparency so that they know what's happening and give them the ability to control to whatever extent uh, what they can do. And this is really key because for the Amazon story, it was really interesting where the headlines were Amazon's AI gets biased or something, pretty much giving the intention or the blame to the AI as opposed to Amazon, right? And, and that's very important for machine learning engineers to sort of understand that it's your data, you should know, you should understand what's in it, uh, and not attribute it to some uh, fuzzy sort of AI kind of thing. Right? So that, making that part of the training and my research has been. I mean, and I think your point is, is well taken that, yeah, you're trained in machine learning, not in ethics. I, I guess the question is, is how do we go into the future, right? I mean, in other words, is that the sufficient way to go? Or should we be putting resources or allowing for training outside of the discipline maybe to understand some of these concepts and appreciate them as we go forward? I mean, it's just an open question. In every age when a new technology appears, people try to apply their existing ethics to their technology. And in the end, what actually happens is that the technology changes the society and that changes the ethics. This is actually happening all over again today. We are seeing AI through the prism of our pre-AI ethics. I think one of the most interesting things that machine learning will do for us is that it would actually force us to work out actually what we mean by a lot of ethical issues and to revisit a lot of the assumptions that we're making. Right now what we're doing is we're projecting onto AI either you know, naively that it's very objective just because it's an algorithm. We in this room know that that's not true, but a lot of people have that impression because it's mathy, it must be right. or you know, we see that a lot in the media. We, we fall into this so-called homunculus fallacy of seeing a little human being inside the AI with all the cognitive biases of a human being, but that's, that's not what's happening either. So I think we, as much, you know, we're gonna have to work this out as we go forward, but I think we should be aware of this fact that it's not that eth ethics is a fixed point and AI will, you know, we will shape our AI according to our ethics, is that ethics is always changing. The ethics of us today is completely different from what it was, you know, 100 years or 200 years ago. And the 100 years from now, it will again be different. And partly, part of that will be caused by, by AI and the uses of society, of AI that society makes. So, I mean, as you guys think about how your skill sets have evolved over time and, 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 the, and the different aspects of, of your careers and what you've needed for training, I mean, as, as ICS in particular starts to plan for the future, where do you think that resources, infrastructure, these types of things, where, where should investments be made to try and prepare the next generation, basically, to understand and be able to tackle new problems as they arise? Do you have thoughts on this? I've had, oh, go ahead. Uh, so I was thinking some of uh, what Peter mentioned, just foundational concepts in some sense are gonna carry over much more versus, I don't know, deep learning is all the hype for now. I'd say particular algorithm obviously very powerful, but what I've often taught my students is you have to know how to evaluate whatever black box somebody hands you and what that actually means in the human context and how do you apply that. And that often ends up being the much more richer way that no matter what the latest technology is, um, if you can't do that, you, it's easy to be fooled in some sense. And um, that's a very foundational thing I try to keep teaching people. When you look at, at mentorship over the years, it used to be handing down a craft or a skill. And coming about 20 years ago, I helped sponsor one of the first capstone projects here. 
And I came in to be a mentor to share all my wisdom. And what I learned is I learned just as much from them as they were learning from me because the window of evolution and change is happening so quick. And even my son, who's 16 right now, when I was teaching him how to do his first game, I started to apply my way of learning on top of it, which is if you want to program first, you have to learn syntax. Then you have to learn procedures. And it's like, oh, god, this is so boring. He goes, I can just go online and figure out how to do it. And he was kind of right in the sense that he had a problem he wanted to solve. He didn't want this massive domain knowledge. He wanted to get in there and, and work on it. And so the, the classes and the projects that they're doing here, there's a number of different competitions, and there's hackathons, and there's game devices. And all of those are, to me, adding in what is our next evolution in the learning process here, which is taking these ideas and, and in many cases narrative story approaches to how are we going to be talking about doing things. I mean, even to your point about AI as it starts to evolve and becomes more human, it's the, the connections that make it more human that are going to remove those barriers. And it's, it's through the quote, what we would have called non-tangible in those days, it's actually tangible today. I think, to repeat my point from earlier, I think it's actually that we work in computer science in sort of a permanently ephemeral culture. You know, the token ring stuff we learned back in the 70s, nobody teaches that anymore. It's sort of, we've found the bugs, we've moved beyond it, right? So we're always, I think, as computer scientists, perpetually locked in the ever-evolving moment, right? So the methods I learned in AI as an undergraduate here, they're gone completely useless. But I think, for, to Pedro's point, the foundational evaluation heuristic analysis process that we go through, experimental testing and so on, that's foundational. That's going to be around for a while. I also think that working in a domain, learning how to move efficiently and learn a domain so that you can apply your computer science magic to it, that would be a great skill to be taught explicitly, as would be the skill of communication, as well as this humanist perspective I, I was trying to talk about earlier. So I think there, it, there's always going to be temporary type one knowledge, type knowledge that goes out of date in about two years. We're always going to be part, doing part of that. But I think these other more foundational things, including the social, metacognitive, human things are perpetual. I think going along with that, uh, with statistics, I think one thing that it would be important is learning, designing, of, like design of experiments and how data collection comes into play and what, tie, what interpretations you can make, what generalizations you can make about your results. Uh, because we could have a lot of data, but if it's not collected properly or if it's not collected in a way that you can answer the question that you want to answer, it doesn't matter. So I think that that's something that would be important to, to emphasize and to provide more training. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, one thing that wasn't brought up but I think is important to Pedro's point, earlier point of like, Having everybody know how to program, having everybody know how to train their machine learning classifier in a way that makes sense, that requires scaling up of education, at least by several orders of magnitude. And that's where the sort of resources could directly translate into an impact. If we can teach 10 times more students while still being effective teachers, that would be pretty amazing. Yeah, scale, scalability in teaching is, is, is a, an issue that all of us are happening to, uh, to address and, and maintain a quality pedagogical experience at the same time. I mean, I think that, that that's certainly a challenge that we have to overcome um, or meet or an opportunity, so we say, um, in, the, in those ranges. So kind of thinking a little bit, switching gears just a little bit, but thinking about training. I mean, one of the things that I wanted to ask you guys about that's, that, that's been interesting for me because I've gotten to see the evolution over my, my career, both um, as an undergrad up to where I am now, is kind of the role of undergraduate education and training in, in, in industry and in research and versus the master's and versus the PhD. Because, you know, it, to give you an example, um, not even 10 years ago, you know, I mean, most companies only wanted a master's level statistician would be an example with this. But today, we have things like the Bachelors of Data Science, which really trains people to be able to walk out into industry and to start to tackle new problems. So do you have thoughts on kind of how the paradigm is shifting in terms of responsibilities and opportunities for students as they're at the undergraduate level versus the, the master's and PhD level as we go through? 
Have you seen a shift in this, or am I the only person that's ever <laughs> seen a shift in this? Because I've certainly seen differences in hiring patterns of industry, um, and it's become more and more common. Well, one, one example of this shift that I've seen in machine learning over the last you know, 20 years was that usually when you get a PhD, you do not expect to be able to work in your field. You get your PhD, it was fun, hopefully you contributed some new knowledge to humanity, and then you go to do whatever, you know, there is a job to do, right? And when I, when I entered the program at UCI, this was the case of machine learning. Most of my, you know, cl you know classmates that were graduating didn't, didn't, you know, go on to the jobs in machine learning. And then suddenly, this was around 1995, you know, things changed. Every company wanted to have a data mining lab, et cetera, et cetera. And suddenly, you know, there was a demand for machine learning PhDs. And then this has only kept on growing, you know, literally exponentially. People, you know, broadly think this is something that happened in the last couple of years. But these days, if you have a PhD in machine learning, you, you make an astronomical amount of money. Peter Lee, who's the, you know, the head of Microsoft Research, he says that, you know, the going price for, for an expert in deep learning, right, not just machine learning, but deep learning, <laughs> is comparable to an NFL quarterback prospect. This is very unusual, right? And now, <laughs> to say the least, right? I mean, in a way, it's good. Like, hey, the geeks have finally won, right? You know, let's, <laughs> let's celebrate. But, but the, it also means that there's a very big imbalance going on, right? And how do we fix that imbalance, right? I think there's a couple of ways in which we fix that imbalance. One is we just need to train a lot more people in machine learning. And fortunately, PhDs take a long time. And also, unfortunately, the professors, you know, are going to industry, so we're eating our seed corn, right? There's actually less ability to produce these PhDs than there was before, right? So I think on the one hand, we do need to produce you know, more PhDs in machine learning. On the other hand, we need to make it easy for people who do not have PhDs in machine learning to use machine learning. And in that regard, you know, I have at least two thoughts. One is I really like this idea that a lot of places have now of um, not just double. So for example, double majors in field X and computer science I think are a wonderful idea. People really know their field, but they also really know how to use the computer science, the AI, the machine learning in what they do. And even programs that are joint, you know, that are data science, you know, applied to X, Y, or Z. This, I think, is definitely a thing that could grow to be a lot bigger than, than it is today. And another one is, again, this is, a, this is a, a refrain these days, but I think it's an important one, is continuing education. This idea that you get a bachelor's and then go work, or maybe get a, a, a PhD, this is 20th century, right? In the world that we're going into, you know, knowledge becomes updated all the time. You don't know where things are going. You have to think of, you know, like a university should not be something that you get a degree from and then, you know, go back for alumni events. It should be your lifelong partner in your education, right? Lifelong, like, you know, like through every decade of your life, you should be doing new things, learning, and your university should be your first resource in doing that. Again, I think a lot of universities already get this, but it has much, much farther to run. Yeah, and that, that was really one of the biggest motivations for, I, I think it was Hal Stern that had mentioned, you know, a, a new master's of data science, a professional degree in data science. And, you know, I mean, we see the need for that coming from the fact that we, times have evolved. A lot of individuals may have trained in computer science or trained in engineering or trained in statistics, but haven't really put those fields together. And so we view that as a, a real contribution to the working professional to retool and retrain and constantly learn and develop their skill set. So I, I totally agree. So actually, Pedro, you gave me a great idea. A, I like your idea of the continuous education process, um, but the cool idea I get from you is we need, you know how the NFL has player, player <laughs> trading cards? We need ML science <laughs> trading cards. That's a great idea. I'm patenting that right now. How much right would now. a Pedro rookie go for? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So he's right out of, he's got a specialization in optimization. And, you know, so that's one idea. But I really like this continuation, continuation notion um, beyond just what we think of as normal continuing ed. Um, I also, at the same time, wonder about the value of yet another certification. Right, because uh, the certifications come and go, and so I have a, a data science certificate in agricultural science for uh, uh, soybeans in Lower Slovenia. Uh, thanks, <laughs> right? Um, and so it might be that, you know, in particular, I work at Google, and we hire a lot of people who don't have traditional degrees. That's not well known, but they don't have traditional degrees, but they can perform. So we hire kids basically from well-known institutions um, that have done remarkable things in their capstone projects, right? Or they come up and they say, look, 
I've got this great JavaScript editor for PDF or whatever it is, right? Um, if they can perform and we can evaluate them in some way, then we will hire them, right? So it's an interesting question. What's the future of the certificate, both for classic degrees like PhDs, but also these sort of nano degrees? or specializations in various areas. Yeah, and I think going back to something that Jonathan had mentioned, you know, I think one of the, one of the priorities there is not necessarily just the applied specialization, but foundational training to go along with that. You know, I mean, and that, that, that was the, the aspect here, is to get foundational training, maybe if you're coming from an engineering background, to have some more foundational training in probability and in computing, for example, as you're kind of walking through. So, I mean, I think that's, that's part of the key here. One, one quick addition to that. So, so by the way, I think the important thing is to have lifelong education, whether it's formal or informal, is actually less important. It's important for employers to be able to gauge how good people are at different things and what they know. And, and, uh, um, you know, and I think that is, is actually something that, that, uh, um, that machine learning is, is, is also helping with. So I wanna switch gears to the last topic, but it, I've saved the, certainly to me, the most important for last, and I think to, to most of us in this room. And you've, had, you've heard a lot of people heard them discuss the importance of, of diversity in ICS here. Um, and so I, I wonder if, if each of you actually can give your thoughts on, on the importance of bringing that diversity into the field, how it's going to propel new and exciting ideas and what the implications of that are. But more importantly, how do we go about doing it? You know, how, how do we make this more of a reality as we go through? Yeah, so I, I think it's, it's really important to reach out to people of different backgrounds. I mean, partly, you know, we've been talking about how computing is going to be part of various different aspects of society. Uh, and, and being able to do that requires people from different backgrounds and not just domain experts, but just people with different experiences where they can look at the same problem um, or the same domain and say, wait, the way we are approaching this is wrong or the worst case use, usage of this model might be really bad, um, and, and, and things like that. So I think, I think it's incredibly important for all of these reasons, for computer science or computing to remain relevant, is to make sure we are, we are making those connections. As to how to increase diversity, that's a much more difficult problem. Um, you know, we've been trying to, I think, focusing more on the capstone projects and more applied things often end up um, making things much more grounded uh, in a way that computing maybe not, hasn't always been, uh, and that definitely attracts, uh, attracts an audience that, that we would be happy to get, but yeah. That's, uh, John, if you want to. Um, I was thinking back to, so before I came back to school, I was a software engineer for a couple of years. I was actually on track to go to medical school and I rebelled against my parents by being a software engineer. But anyhow, um, <laughs> and I worked for a software tech company where it was a bunch of like 20 to 20-ish, like young white and Asian men, basically. And I definitely found that was a huge problem. Because I thought, oh, I would distinguish myself by being the best programmer here. And I'm like, oh, crap, everybody here is the best programmer here. It's actually, we all have the same strengths, we all have the same weaknesses, and there's a huge paucity of ideas, basically, as a result. So I definitely found that that was actually very limiting. I saw how much, if you don't attend to diversity, how limited you will become. Um, how to solve the problem, I, I think that's much tougher. But I think some of that's when you recruit, you recognize the value of that, and you don't opt optimize for a very narrow objective function, and you recognize where the, um, somebody with a different background, you can actually get very valuable ideas from as well. And don't just recruit someone who's just like you, because that's we have this natural human bias, which Amazon demonstrated, we recruit what we're used to. Yeah, I mean, in, in the diversity that I'm referring to, it, it, it's more than just ratio. It's more than just gender, it's also socioeconomic, right? I mean, as, as kind of the gaps widen with respect to computing and computing abilities, this is going to, to increase into being an issue. And so it's, it's, it's a question of how do we increase diversity all around in that broad spectrum, right? You know, for us at Google, it's, it's, diversity is super important, not Samir. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Samir was totally, he was uh, still, I'm yeah, good, not, okay, not, it's, it's one of us. shaking my head. Right? In any case, uh, we, we have, when we develop products, we, we're developing code basically for the world. And so it's not okay to ship an app whose units of measurement are imperial measures. Like, that's dumb, don't do that. So we have to actually be very conscious of the style and attitudes and approaches of all these different things. So, Having this international focus is super important to us, um, as is you know, testing with different groups of people. So for example, 
I did a usability study on a, a piece of software I worked on for a long time. And I will never forget this woman who came in. She, we were debriefing her about her experience. And she said, I hated it. Why? It was the most white male fascist piece of software I've ever seen in my life. Mm. That stuck with me. <laughs> uh, and so it's one of those moments, though, when you realize she's right, actually. <laughs> and it causes you to rethink. So this diversity thing is kind of not optional. It's really essential to what we do if we want to continue to make good progress in our field or in our products or what this whole enterprise is all about. There are two big takeaways specifically from UCI, and I'm going to answer the question in reverse because I, I, I'm excited about the things we can do because I feel like I'm a reformed white male. And when I, they had a thing called SPOP, which I don't know if all of you were part of, but it was an orientation, and you could go in and be a coordinator for it over the summer. So I signed up for it, and the first thing that you do is you go through diversity training. And the training was to use all of the disparaging words that you could come up with and say them so that you would put it out into the open. And we did this, and we did it for weeks. And then at the end, they did the evaluation of what did you learn? And I said, well, I walked in here thinking everybody was pretty equal. And now I can't look at somebody without thinking that you're this color, or you're that race, or you're that gender. And I said, so it actually had the reverse power on me. I wasn't asked to be a coordinator back the next year because I just <laughs> <laughs> But then it was also in my MBA, there was a, a class called Women in Business. And the teacher that was teaching it, I had taken her class and another one loved her. She was an amazing teacher. And she asked me to be in the class. And why do you want me? I'm A, not a woman. And B, what, what can I do to add in? And she said, well, just go in there and be the typical white male. <laughs> And, OK. <laughs> and by having to say the kind of things that were very typical, it made you realize how awful and disgusting they were. But up until my life, I was sort of on that track to doing it. And it gave me such a huge perspective by living what I thought I wasn't, realizing that I was. And it came out of here. And then so now in the artistic world that I spend a lot of my time in, that's a big part of what we do, is how do you tell stories that not show a diverse view, but actually show a united view? And that's the part that I feel we miss in a lot of these diversity conversations, is we really are, at the core, so similar. And the more we can learn the stories that other people have to tell, and how we can bring those and show, <laughs> we can even empirically show how, how similar we are versus diverse, uh, maybe it'll make a difference. And we can hopefully lead the way. Here's an interesting angle on diversity coming from machine learning. Something that we didn't know back in the 80s, early 90s, but is very well established now, is that in machine learning, using an ensemble of models almost always works better than having a single model. All of the big successful applications of machine learning use many different models of many different styles, learning different ways, all combined in some way. But moreover, there's the beautiful, very simple theorem that actually shows what are the conditions under which this works? And you really need two things. If you have classifiers, let's think of classifiers because they're the most you know, widespread type of machine learning. If you have classifiers that are individually accurate and yet uncorrelated, so they, they, they're each accurate, in, they're each high performing in its own right, and yet they are uncorrelated, I mean they tend to make errors in different places, then as you add more of these classifiers, eventually you will get something that is 100% accurate. Of course, at some point, you can't have both in correlation and being accurate. But the point is, you have to look out for these two things. You have to look to add new things that are different from the ones that were there before, but also that are good in its own right. Like just being different for its own sake actually can, can really make things get worse, which I think has an interesting implication for diversity, which actually I think gets to your point, which is, Diversity has many dimensions. And I think we have a tendency to start with general principles on diversity and then funnel into gender and race, maybe socioeconomic status also a little bit. That these are all good, but diversity has many more dimensions. We need a more diverse notion of diversity. What are the dimensions along which we are not getting enough people in computer science? 
And I would say that one really important one is differences in cognitive style, differences in problem solving style. And you know, these may correlate with some of the others or they may not, in fact, ideally they won't. Right? So I, I think one thing that we tend not to notice in computer science because as computer scientists we're all a little bit like this is that it takes a special kind of mind to actually work with computers. You have to be OCD to get one, every one of those little bugs out and the whole complicated system to work, right? This is not normal, right? <laughs> normal people do not, do not think like that. Yeah, exactly, right? And, and, and I mean, the reason there's a lot of people like that in this field is that it's necessary, right? It's, it's the state at which computers are. But the more we can bring in the people who have entirely other ways of looking at things, partly through the computers being more you know, amenable to human interaction, partly through education and so on, the better off we will be. And I think we have a really long way to go in that regard. In fact, in some ways, I think a program like you know, ICS here at UCI is uniquely placed to be at the forefront of doing this. Yeah, and I certainly, we're, we're kind of coming to the end of our time, and I, 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 could, I would like to have this topic going all night, to be quite honest. But you know, I mean, I think one of the things that we try and do, you know, and, and, and how to create diversity, you know, the guiding principle within ICS and, and at UCI, to be quite honest, has been to, to live your values and express your values and express the fact that we uh, appreciate diversity. But I think even better, I, the, the, the key to this really is, is to train good ambassadors. And I, I think we've, we've, we've done a good job at this and I think we will continue to try and do a good job at this because I think as you start putting out more and more ambassadors through students that are expressing this need to have diversity for intellectual and research excellence, but, but all the other aspects that go along with it I think is going to be critical to, to be quite honest to, the, to us flourishing as a discipline as we go forward, so. Um, one thing yeah, yeah sure. absolutely. So I think that we also need to focus, I mean, and I think that ICS is pretty good about this, trying to bring in more diverse faculty members or people in leadership positions because I think as you see people that are more similar to you, just in terms of background, it doesn't have to be race, whatever, it, just the, the background, seeing someone that got to where they are and seeing that they're similar to you, then you're like, oh, well, I can do that too. And then I also think reaching out to, to children, I know it's a long way for them, but it's a, it's a good time to get them interested in, in the field. And Start young, exactly. So we, we started late, so we ran over just a little bit. We might have time for one or two questions for the panel if anybody has questions. Yes. Just to be clear, my point is absolutely not that ethics should be subject to AI. Completely the opposite. AI is just another tool. Human beings are amazing because we make tools. AI is our latest, greatest tool, but it's a tool. You know, that what we do with AI should be driven by what we want to do with AI, okay? My point is actually a little bit different is that if you look at human history, different ages have different ethics that are largely a product of what the technology of the age made possible. Now, when people were hunter-gatherers, they had one kind of ethics. Feudal societies had a very different kind of ethics because their technology was agriculture and the limited resource was land, right? In the last 200 years, ethics have changed tremendously. What has made that happen? It was the Industrial Revolution. It was the fact that now labor could be done by machines and it didn't need to be done, for example, by slaves anymore, right? It freed up, I mean, like there are all these, you know, like, you know, where did the middle class come from, right? Today, we have middle class ethics. The middle class rose because of trade that was made possible by seafaring, et cetera, et cetera, very different from the feudal system. The point that I'm making is that technologies like computing, in particular like AI, they are going to radically transform society. We are just at the beginning of this. And the society that we have at the end of this transformation will be as different from today's society as today's society is different from the society of 200 years ago, including in ethics. So all that I'm doing is I'm making a plea for us to not think of ethics as a fixed point, right? There's this assumption usually in ethics that like, oh, these you know, moral principles are incontrovertible. But actually they were different 50 years ago and we're different 50 years from now. So the point I'm making is that our ethics has to evolve to, keep, to take into account what our society is going to become, right? And this is a dialogue that we need to have as a society. Our job as computer scientists is to inform society. And I also think another 
very interesting angle on this is that, I mean, I'll give you an example. If we have self-driving cars, right, this is a popular field today, they're gonna have to make ethical decisions, right? Do I serve left and kill one person? Do I serve right and kill, you know, five, right? How do I make those decisions? This is just one small example. What about intelligent weapons? These are ethical questions that have been with us forever. But, it, but because we now have to program machines to make these decisions one way or another, this is actually, I think, is going to have a very salutary effect of actually forcing us to figure out better what our ethics are. I mean, some people say like, oh, we can program, you know, Asimov's three laws of robotics into computers, right? Actually forgetting that Asimov's stories were all about how those, those laws failed, right? Or we could say, oh, let's, and that's like the rule-based expert system, AI approaches so are like, oh, we should let the AIs, the robots, learn ethics by observing people and doing the same thing. But then they'll be very confused because we say <laughs> one thing and we do another, right? Just put on a watch TV. <laughs> maybe that's one option. So I think in some ways, you know, most of, a lot of, maybe the best things we will learn from machine learning will be what it forces us to learn about ourselves and we should be open to that. I think on that note, that sounds like a great segue into the networking hour. <laughs> <laughs> Can we thank our, uh, our panel?